So hi, everybody, and welcome to the AMENS or Almond Lifecycle presentation. I'm Danielle Vinstra, Sustainability Communications Senior Manager here at the Almond Board. Um, but in addition to that, I'm a third generation uh, almond farmer myself. I'm probably going to say AMENS. That's actually how farmers, a lot of us say it here in California, um, but I'll try to say both for you. Um, but before I pull up the presentation and start talking you through the life cycle and different components of that, um, I wanted to give you a look into what's actually in the the orchard right now. So I live adjacent to my family's farm. Um, and so I went outside this morning and pulled a branch off the tree. So you can see this. I know you're going to see it in some sessions later um, in the day as well as those are live in the orchard. But to give you a look at what's on the trees right now, um, the almonds are actually almost about full size. They're in their fuzzy outer holes right now. Um, so that's what you see there. So a, a closer view of that is here, so it's it's kind of this fuzzy green thing. Um, and the almond inside is actually about full size already. Um, so this is, like I said, fuzzy on the outside. Almonds are actually a close cousin to peaches. So if you think of this as like the outer part of the peach, it's um, really sweet and sugary. It's what we call the hull. Inside of this is the shell of the almond. So they grow inside a shell. If you think of a, um, a peach, it would be like the pit um, is the shell. And then inside that pit of the peach, if you've ever opened it, there's a seed inside. But with almonds, we eat the seeds. Um, so they're, they've grown a little differently. I'll talk to you in the presentation about how we use all these other things, not just the nut. And of course, here's one of the almonds right now that I've cracked out of of one of the, the holes. They're not ready yet. They're actually um, like gel inside right now, but you can see the skin is already developed. It's gonna turn brown later in the year, but right now it's this white and it's um, definitely more watery uh, than, than anything you'd be used to. But you do see them actually in farmer's markets and on menus um, here in the springtime. So if you ever encounter those, give it a try because it's a whole new flavor profile. Um, and, and very interesting and different from, from uh, almonds in general. So. I'm going to pull up my presentation now and uh, bring you through the life cycle of an almond each year, as well as um, what it looks like over the course of the orchard's life cycle. So that 25 year lifespan and try and get this on presentation mode. There we go. All right. So we said who I am, I'm Danielle Veenstra and I'm um, here in California Central Valley where um, almonds are grown. And so I guess to start there, why California? Um, so the reason that we're here in California and growing uh, almonds, specifically 80% of the world's almonds, is because we have the right climate. So California is one of five regions around the world with the Mediterranean climate needed to produce almonds. Um, that's important because if you're trying to grow them somewhere else, you're fighting against the climate. It has the cool, wet winters and the warm, dry summers um, that we need for production. Um, but in addition to that, California has some other things going for it as well, in that California has, you know, water infrastructure to move that where it's needed, when it's needed. You'll hear more about that um, in the water presentation I'm going to give later today. Um, but in addition to that, we have amazing uh, research partners here that have allowed us to be so innovative and I think just, you know, so productive. That 80% really comes from a lot of partnerships with specifically like University of California Davis, who the Almond Board has been partnered with since the 1970s to improve production practices, improve yields, but also reduce our impact and improve sustainability. And so that's a great partnership that we have. And I think you're going to see that come through in all the different topics that we talk about um, during this tour. So really excited to um, share, be sharing that with you guys. So moving on to the next slide here. Um, beyond why, who are we? So the, the who here, um, you know, for the, the almond industry and almond community, it's really made up of 7,600 uh, almond farmers, 100 processors. And so that's the people the, the nuts go to once they have been taken off the tree and harvested. They're the ones who um, sell the almonds around the world. Farmers don't do that directly. And then together that community generates uh, 110,000 jobs here in California. So as a, a broader community, that's who we are. But really, you know, when we look at who this industry is, it's largely family farms. 90% um, of almond farms are family farms. Um, over or nearly 70% are 100 acres or less. And the reason you've got some personal photos here, they're actually my family, um, is because my family is a good example of what these, you know, a, a family and a, a farm like this look like. Um, so, you know, the, the large family photo here is a, a multi-generational photo, but 
Um, a lot of people in that um, photo are involved in the almond industry and growing some of the almonds you might, um, you know, buy and eat at the store, but it's where we grow up. It's where we live. I grew up, uh, you know, in a house in my family's um, almond orchard. My dad grew up in a house up the driveway. You can see there are some old photos of him and my uncle swinging in front of um, in front of their orchard that was in the, the 60s already. Um, it's also a place where we take our family photos, you know, whether it was me in high school um, or my grandma back in the 70s. We truly um, live and work and play in these orchards. And so it's not just, you know, they're not just our business, they're also our home. And so the way we treat them and the way we farm is recognizing that, right? Um, and that, that sustainability and that generational nature, also talking about the, I'm gonna talk about the length and the lifespan of almond orchards, um, that plays a big role in that as well. And the really, the need for careful thinking and decision-making um, and overall sustainability, because you know we, we look to pass these things down to generations, they're a generational thing. Um, and so it's really important that we're doing it right and doing it sustainably so we can pass it down to future generations. Specifically, this is my family's farm. It's a snip from Google of what an orchard looks like, but it helps to give you some context. Um, it's rows of trees, yes, but it's also, like I said, um, our homes are here. Um, you know, this is my my the home I grew up in is at the, the um, far right side. My grandmother's home where my dad grew up is kind of in the center. Um, you can see next to one of the homes, we have solar there that powers um, both of the homes, the irrigation pump within the, um, the field is powered by that and the shop, but um, specifically my family's farm, it's, it's 40 acres. So, you know, one of the smaller farms, like we talked about, about 90 miles east of um, San Francisco in a town called Escalon, a small town here in the Central Valley. Um, the first orchard from my family was planted in 1965. So my grandpa um, and great uncle planted that and were one of the first ones in the area to, to grow almonds. Um, they did really well here. And so the, the second one, we um, I actually was part of planting that in 1996. And I remember doing that with my grandpa and dad and mom and grandma and siblings. Um, and so our orchard now is actually 25 years. And I'm gonna be talking about um, orchard transition and, and redevelopment in the coming slides. And so, you know, some things that my family and I've been talking to my dad about <laughs> um, for you know, the past couple of years of, of considerations of what we're gonna do next as that orchard is kind of getting to the end of its lifespan. Um, within the orchard specifically, there's 30 tree rows. Um, within that, there's multiple varieties. So I'm gonna talk to you about what um, some highlights of different almond varieties. Um, specifically, we have 50% non pareil and then the other ones are Sonora and Carmel. Um, we're on a rootstock, which I'm gonna explain what that is. Um, it is actually a peach plant, um, a peach rootstock, and it's specifically called Nemagard. And then, like I said, solar is um, what's really powering all of this and a, something that we're seeing um, increasingly be adopted through a lot of um, orchards and processors here in California. We've got abundant sun sunshine, so let's use it. So on to varieties. There's actually 30 different um, main varieties grown here in California, but the one predominantly grown that is the most um, desirable, marketable, has you know just great flavor characteristics for a raw snacking almond um, is our nonpareil. So that makes up about 40% of what we grow here. So like I said, the main variety, and then the other ones serve as um, pollinators to it. So I'm gonna talk about cross-pollination in a bit and why we need multiple varieties, but they also meet the needs of different, um, like CPGs. They might have different characteristics in terms of size or flavor that better fits, um, you know, what they're trying to create or what, um, you know, what you're looking for in terms of a product that you're developing. So from the farmer side, when we're looking at varieties, we're thinking about things like, is the pollen compatible with the other ones? Because like I said, it's important for cross-pollination bees to bring pollen from tree to tree um, to pollinate them. And we wanna make sure that the timing overlaps well during bloom. Um, we're considering like, are they especially vulnerable to insects or disease? It might be a disease that's common in this area. Um, and so we wanna avoid that one. What's the yield potential, um, specifically harm harvest timing separation. So when we harvest, um, we wanna make sure that there's enough window of time that we can do the harvest process for each variety individually, because it's important that we sell them um, and you know they get different prices individually. Um, compatibility with root stocks and then marketability as well. So there's a lot of considerations um, farmers you know, are, are thinking about as they're looking at varieties. And then the next slide here is root stocks. So this is, I'm gonna talk about the grafting process here in a second, but 
Um, almonds, you know, the, the tree is actually the variety on the top that we grow. And then down at the bottom is what we call the rootstock. You can see the bottom photo there actually shows it in practice. And if you were to go into an orchard, you would see that um, on each of the trees. It's what we call the graft union where the, the variety meets the rootstock at the top. This is a traditional, um, you know, a tree cultivation practice. It's actually been around since the, um, the Chinese and in ancient China invented it. Um, but farmers, the reason we have a different rootstock on the bottom and the, the plants are compatible in that way is that we're looking for and the varieties on top may not be a perfect match for what we need and what's going to work best in the soil. So with the um, rootstocks, farmers consider things like anchorage. Is it really windy where you farm? Um, if it is, you're going to want one that does a better job clinging into the soil and is more stable. Um, there's other things like soil drainage and um, the, the plant's ability to withstand or, or, you know, put up with what we call like wet feet. If it's an area that's more clay soil, you might want one that, um, that does that. We're thinking about things like soil pH, disease resistant, pest, pest resistance, um, and things like dwarfing or vigor. How big, they kind of dictate how big the tree can get. And some, you know, sometimes you do want a bigger tree or you don't. Um, it, it depends too how how tightly you space your orchard and the, the room between the rows and between the trees. Um, so lots of things farmers consider there um, with regard to rootstocks as well. And so I talked about how this works. So grafting it, like I said, it's a traditional um, practice for tree and horticultural production. Um, you can actually do it out in your yard on a rose bush or anything like that, but it's where you take um, you know, something you want from the, um, for us, it's the, the variety you want. So what's the most desirable, um, what has the you know, characteristics you want in those varieties, but then you put it on the root system, the bottom of the plant, which has those things in the ground that work best for us. And so, like I said, this is a, a traditional um, technique where you, they literally slice them together, um, tape them up and they start to grow together. This happens in the nurseries. Um, for us. So when, when farmers buy trees from the nursery, this is already done, but you put in your order to the nursery, selecting your variety and rootstock specifically. Getting to that, orchard development. So um, almond orchards are commercially productive for about 25 years. So I talked about my family's. It was planted in 1996. We're right up at that, but we're considering things like, you know, how's the yield looking? Um, you know, all these different factors to say, is it still commercially viable to us for us to keep farming? And for my family, the answer is so far, yes, we're going to be looking at what harvest is this year. Um, but, you know, we're carefully watching these things because we also know when we replant the first three years, we do not harvest. Um, the trees are too small. They're not big enough um, for that. And there's not enough crop on it to make it worth it. So we have to be thinking long term about that. Um, and then it takes them a while to get back up to peak production or mature production. That peak production is in about year 12. Um, and from there, it's kind of a, a slow decline off to average year 25, but that's where farmers are looking closely at where do the input costs match the output in the, the crop that's um, you know coming off the trees and, and what we can sell there. Um, so within the orchard, like I talked about, they're planted um, with two to three different varieties and alternating rows, and then the rootstock is the same for the entirety of the orchard. Um, I should say there are some varieties um, that are now uh, pretty widely used in the orchard and they're or in the industry and they're becoming increasingly so um, that are self-compatible. They actually don't need that pollen to be brought between the trees. It still needs to move within the flower and within that one tree, um, but those are called self-compatible varieties. Uh, the most widely known is, is Independence. There's also one called um, Shasta and Liberty. There's some other ones out there. Um, so those are becoming increasingly popular, but they are not the, um, you know, the standard in the industry. So with those ones, you would have one variety in the orchard and you would have one harvest. And you still need bees to do a little bit of pollination, but not as many as, um, as you would for a, a traditionally planted orchard. Um, so, um, and then just to, to recognize here, you know, the, the planting or replanting of an orchard represents an opportunity to upgrade your technology. So my family's orchard was planted in 1996. And so my grandpa was thinking carefully about what do we need to be doing here that's going to serve us, you know, up until 2021. Um, and so when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking what's going to serve me out until 2050. 
um, in terms of the technology we put in. So specifically irrigation technology, you're gonna hear from Tom later today about some of that and things that farmers are you know, really thinking carefully about because the decisions we make today stick with us for a very long time. Um, and so it's really important and farmers think very carefully about this um, because yeah, they're, they're, they're with us for a long time. Um, when you know, I think about my family's orchard that's going to be replanted and how old I'll be when that comes out. Um, you know, that's a whole different phase of my life. And you know, by then, you know, if I have children, they'll they'll probably be involved. And so, um, just really thinking carefully about what's not only going to serve the best the orchard the best, but what's going to serve my family and our business the best. So then, the other side of that, the flip side of planting, is replanting or you know, pulling out an orchard. So when an orchard is replanted. Traditionally, what happens is that the trees are knocked over, um, they're ground up into wood chips, and then they're shipped off to what's called cogeneration facilities to make electricity. Um, for a variety of reasons, those are being phased out in California or prioritized actually more for um, forest uh, trees that have to be removed from the forest. And so we're looking for new um, approaches for that. And one that's really emerged as like a really great opportunity and things that a lot of the industry has started to use is what's called whole orchard recycling. Um, and so this is a process by which, you know, again, the trees are knocked over, they are ground up, but instead of taking that biomass and shipping it outside the orchard, we actually put it back into the soil. Um, so within almonds, we've done an LCA, a life cycle assessment on our production overall and what that looks like. And we know that already, the, tr the trees sequester and store a significant amount of carbon during their life cycle. By doing this approach, we actually take that carbon, put it back into the soil and lock it up for an even further amount of time. And so practices like this, our LCA has told us, are really important to further reducing our carbon footprint. I'm gonna talk more about LCA in, in a bit, um, but this practice is also an important way of addressing climate change. Um, specifically, farms that use whole orchard recycling sequester 2.4 tons of carbon per acre. That's a, you know, a number, but it's equivalent to living car free for a year, to pulling a car off the road. So when you think of the amount of, um, you know, acres of, of almonds here in California, about 1.5 million acres, that's a big impact if the industry as a whole starts doing this. And I think it's a really interesting way of how we can start thinking about farms and how our farms can help us positively address climate change and using you know, this biomass that we have to pull carbon out of the air and lock it back into the soil and sequester it for the long term. So that was the long, you know, the, the long term life cycle of an orchard. Now I'm gonna get into the annual life cycle um, or the, the, the creation of each individual almonds. And so um, I'm gonna talk you through each of these steps, but just to show it here in one slide as an overview, um, where the life cycle kind of in my mind starts every year is at dormancy. So that's when the trees have lost their leaves. That's really from like November to January, mid-February, the trees are dormant. So just like, you know, the trees you might have in your backyard, they lose their leaves and they're, you know, what we might think of as hibernating, but there's really important processes happening within the tree where they're getting together the stores of energy they need that's going to power it for the whole year to produce these, you know, amazing, uh, protein dense, dense nuts that we um, love and are an important part of our diet. So from there, we go to bloom, which bloom runs from mid-February to mid-March. Beautiful time of year. If you're ever in California, you definitely need to drive, you know, during that time, you need to drive through the Central Valley and see it. Um, it's also home to a lot of like wedding photos. So a very a beautiful time of year, in, in addition to be very, being very important for um, the production of almonds. From there, we go into what's called nut development, and that's what um, you know you saw from me earlier with my little prop here. So that's the phase we're in now, and that's from mid-March to um, kind of July. So that's where they, they look like this on the tree. You don't see much difference happening besides that they're growing in size. Um, but at this point, they've kind of already grown to full size by the end of April. And so they've grown to full size, but like I told you, they're a gel. So that's when uh, kind of the, the May time frame they start solidifying into the, the crunchy almond that we know and love. And when they really start to get that crunch is the maturing almond stage. Um, it's what we call whole split. So that happens around July 1st. It's where the whole splits open and the inside really starts to get, um, you know, dry out and get crunchier um, like we know it and that the, um, the skin of it starts to turn brown like we all are familiar with. Um, so that happens around July 1st and that's where they're, you know, getting close to harvest. Harvest runs from 
um, August to or mid August to October, depending on the variety, they are ready for harvest at different times. Um, but that is happening then. And then processing, of course, happens, you know, once they've been removed from the orchard. So that process can run anywhere from August to, depending on the volume of nuts, you know, um, February, depends how much and, and how big um, the handler is or the processor is. Um, but from there and during that time, the almonds are stored and then or, you know, turned into a variety of different forms and shipped around the world. So I'm going to talk you through each one of those steps. So the first um, off, like, like I started with, is dormancy. Um, it's when the trees lose their leaves. Um, like I talked about, it's when they're storing up energy for the coming growing season. Um, so going back to actually the climate, an important part of California that it provides for the trees during this dormant season is what's called chill hours. So the trees need a certain amount of cold temperature in the winter to set the buds for the coming year and kind of kickstart that process. It's specifically 400 hours of a certain threshold of temperatures. Um, it's actually on the low end of all the different um, tree crops that we grow here in California. It has um, one of the lower needs for that. But it's important that, you know, we're in a climate where we do get cold winters, um, but then have like hot, dry, warm summers. Um, and also during this time, winter rains fall and that's, you know, filling the soil profile and the, the orchards can use that at the beginning of their growing season to, um, you know, power their growth and all that. And then towards the end of January, this photo at the bottom right is where the flower buds start to swell and those are going to become each of the individual blossoms. And so moving to that, um, bloom and pollination, this is from mid-February to mid-March. Every single blossom that you see here has the potential to be an almond. And every almond that you eat came from a single blossom that was pollinated by a honeybee. Um, bees are, like I talked about a bit earlier, that essential link between bringing pollen from variety to variety, or like I talked about with those self-compatibles, moving the pollen within um, the flower, getting it from the anthers to the stigma. Um, but at this point, I'm, so I'm talking about honeybees. Um, we work with beekeepers. Um, you know, growers have individual relationships with beekeepers who bring their hives into the orchard to help facilitate this process. My family has actually always worked with the same beekeeper or beekeeping family, um, and that's really common throughout the industry. So we have these longstanding relationships where you know we're providing um, an important first source of food. For the honeybees in their year, it's the first thing that blooms in the landscape. It actually helps the hives increase in size and strength during um, during the time that they're here because they're gathering so much high quality pollen and nectar. Um, specifically, the pollen has all 10 amino acids that they need in their diets. And then the, you know, that helps the hives grow big and strong and supports them as they go on to pollinate other crops across the US. So that may, might be apples in Washington, you know, blueberries on the East Coast, citrus in Florida. Um, these play a really important role in our US food system in pollinating crops all across the United States and beekeepers move with them to do that. Specifically within the orchard, you know, a climatic thing here, again, what we need for the Mediterranean climate, ideal weather for pollination and for bloom is dry and above specifically 55 degrees, but it's important that it's not too cold at this time. That's the biggest thing. If we have frost events um, that can damage the delicate bloom. So again, that climate is just super important in that it really, you know, allows the almonds to grow and thrive and not be, you know, damaged or trying to work around the environment. So, nut development, that's where we are today. You can see a, a image here, kind of like what I showed you um, earlier with the, the gel in the inside. Um, but actually starting with the, the photo kind of towards the middle at the top, that's actually what they look like just after bloom. So the, the petals have fallen off. There's a tiny little green piece there in the center and that's gonna grow to be this big full-size almond um, or almond. And so nut development, like I said, goes from mid-March to late June and that's where they're growing up in size and then inside they're turning from that gel more into a solid. Um, so this, you know, at this time, in addition to um, the, the nuts growing on the tree, we as farmers are watching carefully to say, what do the trees need? Um, and we know they need things like water. I'll talk more about specific water requirements in the water presentation later today. Um, but we're watching carefully to see how, you know, when does the tree need water, specifically what, you know, we have uh, different parameters that help us know when it's time to irrigate based on the tree's specific stress and needs. Um, so we know that between March and October, that's when it's hot and dry here. Um, and we need to make sure we supply that. But like I said earlier, some of that early season is also supplied by rainfall. 
Um, you know, this is a, a, a little bit drier of a year. So there were some storms that supplied that. Um, but, you know, again, we look at what the orchard needs, what might be naturally provided by rainfall and then irrigate to, you know, fill that deficit of what the tree specifically needs. And farmers are very careful about that. Um, specifically, we even have a, a goal for um, improving water efficiency overall. But again, I'll talk to you at the, the water session later, and I'm sure you hear about elsewhere as well. But also at this time, we're looking carefully at things like what might be the fertilizer needs, what nutrients do the trees need. We do tissue samples on the leaves um, to see what that is. And then we're also working closely. Um, over 95% of almond farmers have a professional pest control advisor that works with them. Um, and we are we work with them to carefully watch our orchards, see what is what might be present out there, pests, if they're at a level where it could do damage, and then talk to them about things that we may need to do, um, you know, to minimize damage or to control that. So working with professionals to keep a close eye on those things and talk about what might be the best approach. And sometimes it's a, you know, a cultural approach where you um, are doing something like removing a leftover nuts in the orchard in the winter. That's actually maybe the best way to control um, said pest is, is to do that practice in the winter to just remove its food source for later in the year. Um, so we can talk more about that in other sessions. I'm sure you'll hear about that too. Um, but moving on to whole split. So this is um, what's in the, the summer. That was whole split open. They start to turn a yellow color like you can see here, not the fuzzy green. Um, and that's when they really start to dry down inside and get that crunch that we all know and love. Um, and so that's when we know it's almost ready for harvest. So harvest specifically, um, harvest begins in mid-August and or, yeah, about mid-August or early August, depending where you are in the valley and it's a little hotter and drier down in the south. So they tend to start first with harvest and it happens a little bit later up in the north. Um, but that is a multi-step process like you can see here in the photos. Um, but before I go through the process, uh, you know, just to remind us, this happens Three, two to three times, depending on the number of uh, varieties grown within your orchard. And so again, we do that because we want to keep them separate because they have different you know, values and uses. And so it's important that we choose varieties that have a good, um, you know, distinct harvest or, or maturity time when they're ready to be harvested. Um, specifically, you know, what happens actually physiologically on the tree looking at this branch is there's a small window in time and we're carefully watching that where actually the tree lets up its grip on the nut. It, um, you know, it loosens that suture between the nut and the tree. And that's when it's the perfect time for us to go in there and shake. And so we watch that carefully as farmers to say, when is this time? Um, and make sure that our equipment or you know, somebody who might be coming in to harvest for us is all ready to go. Um, and specifically there's, as you can see here, some really different looking pieces of equipment and machinery um, that are you know, operated by skilled technicians who this is their job. It's actually, um, for my family, my cousins have a whole business that's custom farming, or I'm sorry, custom harvesting, where they come in and harvest for smaller farmers who don't have the means to own all these different pieces of equipment it allows them to be experts in harvest, and we trust them to, you know, come in and do that whole process for us. Um, and of course, it's nice for us because it's in the family. Um, but specifically, what harvest looks like, it starts with the shaker. Um, so the the joke of, I guess, why I say almonds, um, but also almond, is we shake the L out of them. Um, but what these shakers do is they um, come up to the tree and it's almost like a lobster like claw, grab the trunk of the tree and shake it for maybe three seconds um, and all the nuts fall right off. So like I talked about, the tree kind of loosens its hold on them. So they fall off and then this drying stage is where they, they just lay where they land. Um, and we let them lay there for uh, about five to 10 days, kind of depends on local weather conditions. Um, but that's where they dry out a bit further there on the ground using the power of the sun um, instead of you know some artificial dryer. So they lay out there and, and dry up and then we sweep them into rows using that sweeper um, in that panel there. So it sweeps them into nice tight windrows, which you see under the drying photo. Um, and then those rows are perfect for what we call the pickup machine or harvester to drive over them essentially like vacuums them up, drops them into a trailer behind the pickup machine. Um, that trailer is then brought to the edge of the orchard. You can see it being dumped here onto an elevator. That elevator puts it into the bed of a, um, a big semi container. And that's what then takes it from the edge of the orchard, um, you know, out of the hands of the grower to the next step of processing. So for a farmer, this is the end of the, the growing season, but it's not where, you know, the end of the almonds journey from our orchard to your table. So the next step um, from there is hulling and shelling. 
So this is where, you know, I talked about, and I can show you here this hole, and there's actually the shell is within it. It just hasn't separated out yet. Um, but almonds go to this place to have those removed. Um, and so they use a series of shaker tables and rollers to do that. Also at this time during harvest, there can be leaves and sticks um, that are picked up in the orchard. So it removes any of that debris. And what you're left with at the end of this process is the brown skin almond, as you see down here in the bottom photo. Um, but I've talked about and touched upon earlier um, zero waste and how we use all the things that the almond orchard grows. I talked earlier about the trees and how we put those to use in the past as electricity and in the present as a, as a way to sequester carbon, put it back in the soil. Um, you know, another benefit of that is we've actually found it increases yields and water efficiency. Um, so a lot of benefits to that practice with the trees, but also with these holes and shells, there's uses for them as well. So. Traditionally, the holes, the fuzzy outside, where I said it's, it's kind of like a peach, it has a lot of sugar there, those have been used and are currently used for dairy feed. Um, so they're used for about uh, 10 to 11% of a dairy cow's ration here in California. It offsets the need to grow other food or um, you know crops to feed those cows. And it's an important part of their diet and provides some good nutrition for them. Um, the shells, traditionally, we've used those as livestock bedding. So pulling those off there, you know, it's a it's a use. It's not a super high value use, but we do put them to use. It's not like they're going to waste. And then to the point of further innovation underway, uh, I've mentioned earlier the almond industry has set some goals around water. Um, there's other goals as well. I'm sure you're going to hear about during different sessions um, of this tour. But one that I'll touch on here, and I, there's a full session actually about it from Josette Lewis later on. Um, but we also have a goal around zero waste, and that's to achieve zero waste in our orchards by putting everything we grow to optimal use. So that key word is optimal, because right now we do put those things to use, the hull, the shells, the trees. Um, but we're working on how can we make those better, both from a, you know, a, a bottom line perspective, but also a sustainability perspective. Where can we meet the needs even better of other industries and provide even greater value? And where this ties into um, really is our life cycle assessment, our LCA. So I have a quote here from um, the author of that study, Alyssa Kindle, talking about almonds um, carbon footprint overall um, is lower than many other nutrient dense foods. But a key component of that is just recognizing the inherent property of trees, right? Well, we sequester carbon or the trees um, sequester carbon over their lifetime. But another key component to our life cycle assessment and carbon footprint is the reuse of our hulls, shells, and woody material. So right now, current almond production practices are offsetting about 50% of their carbon emissions with those two things. And so we know also from this research, when we can further improve the uses for them and improve our production practices, that will bring down our carbon footprint, potentially to carbon neutral, even carbon negative someday. There's a lot of other things that need to you know, fit into place for that to happen, but it is what drives us in this space. And so we know that using these co-products, the hulls and shells and trees is key to reducing our carbon footprint. So this goal, like I talked about, um, you know, putting everything to optimal use, this has been, this was put into place um, in early, I want to say 2019 is when we launched these goals. But since then, we've been funding research and really innovating in this space to see how can we use these co-products for new things that serve needs elsewhere, right? And there's been some really great research in the areas of um, helping to extend the life of recycled plastics. So taking post-consumer recycled plastics and making them last longer and getting more use out of our recycled plastics in the area of fuel, regenerative agriculture, like I talked about with whole orchard recycling. So there's a lot of interesting stuff there and I encourage you to tune into that session later. Um, but just really important to know that this is a driver for us and something we're looking at and saying, how can we be an example for agriculture, right? Will we grow these other things and how do we put them to the best use possible? Because we do put resources into growing them, right? The water that's used to grow them, all that, we wanna get the best use possible and get the most out of you know, what goes into growing, not just the almonds, but these other things as well. So getting back to the life cycle and that journey from orchard to table, um, after the huller and the sheller where those hulls and shells are removed, and I just talked about all the different things we can do with them. Um, but after that, they go to the, um, the processor. This can um, happen different places as well, but they are um, delivered to the handler or processor where they are sized and graded. So, um, that is a mark of quality, the grading, um, but how it works is they go through a series of screens, they have different um, hole sizes, and that's how they, they size them. 
And then robotic sorters will remove uh, any defects that they see from there. And then you see hand sorting here, which is the final quality control tech, um, check before packaging. Um, and so the, like I said, there's different grades and quality levels that are used for different purposes, right? Um, we want a snack nut to be, you know, this perfect, beautiful almond, but if it's getting made into almond milk, it might, you know, it can have more chips or scratches or things like that where we don't care as much about the like visual aesthetics. Um, so then finally to distribution. So after sizing, uh, almonds are kept in uh, controlled storage conditions. So temperature controlled storage conditions um, to maintain quality until they're shipped out. Um, like I said earlier, California produces 80% of the world's almonds. And of that, 33% are consumed right here in the United States. So domestically, that's our um, biggest uh, consumer of almonds. And then 67% um, are exported to other countries all around the world as an important um, source of plant-based protein. And then, you know, another piece with almonds is they're also known for and have a really great long shelf life, up to two years. And so in light of that, knowing that, um, the final piece of how they kind of almost get to your table is um, by being shipped. So almonds are not flown. Um, and with regard to sustainability, we know shipping has the lowest carbon emissions of the most common food transportation methods. So we're really glad that our shelf life lends itself um, to that. And so finally, I just wanted to end for you on where you can find more and where you can um, you know, direct anybody who you might get questions to to learn more, where you can learn more yourself. Um, and these are things that are kept up to date throughout the year. So I'll just walk you through these here. AlmondSustainability.org is actually the section within almonds.com um, where we focus on sustainability and telling the story of how almonds are grown. So not just life cycle like I talked about, but going into water specifically honeybee health, zero waste, family farms, um, our economic impact, um, an overview of the goals and what we're doing there. So that's a great resource for anybody who wants to know more about the production practices and the, the um, overall responsible practices that we are using within our orchards to grow 80% of the world's almonds. Um, almonds.com slash magazine, there's a subsection in here that you can sort by called Growing Good, where we you know, are doing more regular updates and, and little, um, kind of think of them as a blog entry or a magazine entry about sustainability. And so that's another great place you can go and keep track of um, with regard to sustainability. Another um, place, it's actually a channel we're just launching, that's why there's 29 followers on it, but um, we're in the, the process of a soft launch right now, but we'll be launching it in a, the coming months. Um, so at Growing Almonds on Facebook and Instagram is where we're going to be telling our sustainability story in, um, you know, on those social media channels. We have such a visual story to tell, um, and we're also going to be working there to leverage content from farmers themselves. Um, and so, you know, people who are out there talking about their specific farms and what, what they're doing and, you know, using them as a way to, um, to talk to the public and to sh help share that story. So I encourage you to keep an eye out for that and you can direct people there if they wanna learn more. Like I said, it's a soft launch now, um, but we'll be fully getting that up and going in the coming months. And then finally, Growing Good. Um, so this is our annual sustainability report that the Almond Board puts out. It comes out in December of every year. Um, and so you can access that on almonds.com in the annual publication section or in the um, almondsustainability.org, the, the Growing Good section of the that website. Um, but this is where we really pull this all together and um, publish this report every year. And so, again, it goes through those key topics that you're going to be hearing a lot about over the course of the tour. Um, but this is something to, to keep an eye out for every December. Again, a new one gets published. And um, I think, or not I think, we all think it's really important to be transparent about and upfront about, you know, the sustainability practices we use in our continuous improvement journey, right? We're not perfect out here. We're, we're working to continuously improve. And that's, you know, I think that's the biggest thing is to know we're working to continuously improve. We're, we're doing that, you know, out of respect for people who love almonds, but also for ourselves, right? We live on the land. We want to pass it down to future generations. And so it's inherent in what we do and motivates what we do because it's, it's important to the success of that. So with that, my final thank you slide, I'm going to wrap here now. And then I know we're going to open it up for questions. So Thank you all for your attention, um, and I look forward to answering your questions, and I hope you guys all have a fantastic time on the tour. So thank you all very much, and thank you for learning about almonds and being interested in them. Bye. Can you, this is Gabrielle, can you hear me? 
Um, Daniel, why don't you go ahead and start answering the question about um, how harvesting was done prior to mechanization? Sure thing. Yeah, so before um, the shaker mach machines were invented, developed, that was really in the kind of 70s, 80s is when that was invented and became popular. But prior to that, almonds were harvested by hand. Um, and so when I say by hand, that was using either rubber mallets that you hit the kind of big um, structural scaffolds of the tree um, or the trunk, and then with a big pole to knock the um, branches up towards the top. Uh, very labor intensive. You would have um, crews of people who would come out to harvest the field. They would use, um, they would put down tarps underneath the trees. And so you would knock it with a mallet and those sticks and then pull the, the tarps along um, to the next tree. Even prior to that, um, before, you know, more mechanization, um, you would uh, hand crack the almonds um, and get them out of the holes and shells that way. So there's been a lot of mechanization in the industry that's allowed the industry to really, I think, grow in size and scale and to, um, you know, be able to produce as many almonds as we do to meet, you know, the, the dietary needs and uh, wants of people and, and support plant-based diets around the world. But uh, very labor intensive, you know, the way we do it now is is much more efficient, it uses skilled technicians um, and is much more precise as well. So um, there's still a little bit of that hand knocking that gets done sometimes in the winter. If you don't get all the nuts off the tree, sometimes the shaker comes in a little bit the wrong time. You can still see those poles out in the orchard to get like the last couple that are up in the, um, the trees. But predominantly, um, pretty much everyone is using shakers. I will say, I think some places around the world still do hand polling. Um, I want to say there's maybe some in, in Spain and um, and Italy, but overall here in California, we use mechanical shakers. Since we're talking about um, just basic almond growing, can you talk a little bit more about um, some of the newer self-compatible varieties and some of the pros and cons of why they're grown? Absolutely. Yep, so self-compatible varieties, they're newer to the industry. They've really been around and planted for probably the last 10 years here in California. Um, and what the difference is looking at a traditional variety um, compared to those is with the self-compatibles, you need to, or with the self-compatibles, you do not need to have pollen from a different variety to actually pollinate the flower and start the process of growing the almond inside the flower. So specifically then with the self-compatibles, what you do need is the pollen still within the flower from the anthers, um, you know, the little pieces uh, around um, within the petals to hit the stigma, which is the middle piece that that's what initiates fertilization of it. So you still need bees, you still need something to help initiate that process. It's still a, an insect pollinated plant. Almonds are they're not wind pollinated by any means, but it does reduce the need for bees overall. So I talked about stocking rate in the presentation, um, about two hives per acre. That's something that we're looking at as the industry to see how many bees do we need with these new self-compatible varieties. Um, so that's something that we're working on to see if we can reduce the demand within almonds. Um, but the other thing with the self-compatibles is it also changes your harvest um, because instead of doing three varieties and trying to time all that, you're harvesting once. And so you shake once, you sweep once, you pick up once, and it's, it's a very straightforward process. So there's economic um, benefits to farmers in terms of doing that. But farmers are also looking at like, what are the varieties that are gonna get the biggest return for me? And what do I know? Um, so like my family, we're looking to be replanting our orchard here soon and we know self-compatibles are an option, um, but we're probably gonna go with the traditional ones because that's what we're used to. We know how to farm them, um, but it is something that we need to weigh, right? The economics, I think really weigh into that. Um, and it could be that when we figure out the new stocking rate with bees, some of that shifts, but some of those traditional varieties still have really important properties and we know are important to food manufacturers for different um, you know, things that they, uh, qualities and characteristics that they have. So. We also keep an eye on that. So sticking with the harvest theme, um, looking at the questions that have come in, two somewhat related question. One was, how long are the almonds on the ground for, before they're picked up, so the drying period? And the other one was, um, you know, what are some of the parameters like moisture and so forth that are monitored, either to determine when to harvest or how, how they're managed after harvest? Yeah, so in terms of just staying on the ground, and Gabrielle, you may need to remind me about the second part, but staying on the ground, um, we shake them and then they lay on the ground about seven to 10 days, but there's different factors that you look at. 
It could depend on how dry they were when you shook them already. So what you're really looking at is the moisture content of the nut. That's the key thing that you're looking at. So I think that gets to the second point of the question. But there's other factors that you look at as well. Is there rain in the forecast? If there's rain in the forecast, you are going to get those nuts as fast as you can because you don't want them to get wet on the ground. That can actually encourage uh, like growth of mold, different stuff while they're sitting there. You might have to leave them out longer, spread them back out from their windrows. So the biggest factor there is, well, that's why California's Mediterranean climate is so great, because generally we don't get rain around that time of the year. That's part of our dry season. Um, you may see it happen and there's steps farmers can do to, to mitigate any you know, potential damage from that. Like I said, spreading them back out. Um, if things are really bad, they can send them to a dryer. But that's really, I'd say, pretty uncommon. Um, that that happens. So yeah, about seven to 10 days on the ground, but it depends on your moisture going into that. And then the other factor that farmers look to as to when it's time to harvest, you know, they look at the whole color, um, the actual, when you break out the almond, the color of the skin. Um, but the other thing is the tree actually loosens its grip on the nut. There's a, a suture between the tree and the nut. And that gets loose at a, a certain point, and that's exactly when you want to harvest. So you can physically shake the tree and say, this is ready to go because they're all popping off right now. And actually, if you miss that window, they'll tighten back up. Um, so you're <laughs> paying really close attention because you don't want that either. Um, yeah, so I think you actually addressed it both quite. And then other, one other quick question, do Marcona almonds grow in California? So I believe I've seen a couple people who grow Marconas. There's also a variety that's very similar to Marcona. It has the same higher oil content. It's called Sweetheart. Um, and that one, I believe, is grown here in California. I'm pretty sure, Gabrielle, that one was developed by the University of California, right, through our research and breeding trials here. So it has that, um, that unique shape and different, um, you know, higher level of oils in it. So I think there's some grown around here. Um, like I said, Sweetheart is also grown. Um, but not as um, as yeah. as it is in Spain. Yeah, so they are grown. They're not that common. The ye relative yields tend to be much lower than the main varieties we grow. But there are some handlers that, or some growers that have chosen. Um, I'm just going to address one or two quick questions that come in. There was a question about GMOs, um, and the bottom line is currently there are no genetically modified components to an almond. When you as Danielle talked about, we have the scion or the tree part that you see in the rootstock part. They're both bred in different breeding programs because you're breeding for different traits, but it's all done through traditional breeding. Um, and I think the other question that has come up was one around pesticides and pesticide residues. Just wanted to sort of give a relative sense of things. Yes, most, um, let me just start with saying there are organic almonds. There they're just actually hard to grow. It's hard to get enough fertilizer, nitrogen for that high protein food that we enjoy. Um, some of the other things are hard, but it is possible. But, um, but generally residues on nuts, on almonds are low. Um, <clears throat> there's actually a, a federal program, the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service does testing of produce, some 30, 40 items in a year. And back in 2007, 2008, for, for nine or 12 months, they sampled almonds at essentially the retail level. And what I think is interesting there is they ended up putting the almond data into an annex rather than with all the other fruits and vegetables because the levels tend to be in the part per billion range instead of the part per million range. So just wanna say there are residues, but they tend to be low. Yeah, and I think a big part of that comes from the almonds growing inside a hole and shell, right? there. They're actually protected within the orchard through the duration of their life. So I know we're getting close to the end of our time here, Gabrielle. I did want to take one more question. Somebody asked about beer and almond co-products and the whole and shell, which is just fun. So I want to address that. So there was some research where you um, pulled the sugar out of the holes and you could use it in the fermentation process for making beer. I actually had the um, joy or I, the researchers told me, I'm glad you didn't die, but I got to try the beer. Um, so they, <laughs> they were geopane, of course, but, um, but it was at the research level. It is something you can do. There's high sugars in there. Um, so that's, I don't think it really took off. There were some conversations with local breweries about that, but we do know it can happen. There's actually some, um, like almond specific beer that's made with almonds, not the, the holes that seems easier than the, the beer with the holes. But, 
Um, with that, I think that's all we've got time for for questions. We'll try to get back to some of these other ones um, outside of the context of the session. But with that, thank you everyone for joining. Um, there's a lot more resources in the resources section here on the platform. So be sure to check those out and join us for the next session on almond nutrition with Swati uh, Kalgankar from the Almond Board. And, and then we'll see you later at the water session. Thanks everybody. Thank you.